Jesus, we thank you, Lord, and we, your presence is already in this room, God, but we ask for it in greater measure tonight. Holy Spirit, would you come and would you minister to us as only you can here this evening, Lord, to those deep areas of our heart, to the deep issues in our marriages, in our families, in our homes, in our future. Lord, and tonight, would you breathe fresh? Would you breathe fresh on each and every one of us here this evening? Come on, in Jesus' name, somebody say amen, amen, amen. Give Jesus one more shout of praise, one more hand clap. Come on, Freedom House. Well, my name is Pastor Brian. I'm your Irvine campus pastor, and I have the honor and, and privilege of being able to minister God's word here this evening, but before we go any further, I just wanna give honor where honor is due. If you don't know, maybe you're new to Freedom House, honor is one of our core values here at Freedom House Church. And I wanna honor our lead pastors, Pastor Sai and Pastor Marie Silva. I wanna thank them uh, just for all that they do, okay? I, I tell people all the time, anytime I get the opportunity to be able to speak, uh, whether it's a Wednesday or a Sunday, whatever it may be, that I would not be, not just the pastor, but I would not be the man that I am, the father that I am, the husband that I am, uh, if it was not for uh, just the guidance and the mentorship of our lead pastors, Pastor Sian, Pastor Morano, you know, for myself and my wife and our family, we've had to go through a lot of, a number of different seasons and, and they've always been there to help navigate us through it. So come on, can we give it up one more time for our lead pastors, Pastor Sai and Pastor Marie Silva. I also wanna honor my family uh, just for everything that they do, my wife, my, my kids, the extended family that makes it possible, you know, my, my, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, all of them, my, my parents, everybody uh, who just allows me again to be able to operate um, as, as a full-time uh, pastor. Um, and full-time staff member for you know almost the last 12 years, I would not have been able to do anything uh, or be able to give my, my my attention to the ministry if it was not for them and the the countless sacrifices that they have made. Uh, because being a pastor, being on staff full-time, it's not it's not an individual calling; it's a family calling. So I want to honor my family uh, this Wednesday. Now, without further ado, we are going to jump into the scripture. If you didn't get a control note sheet on your way in. Uh, our control notes are just going to have the scripture for tonight. Uh, sometimes Sunday we'll give you points, all that stuff. But tonight, you know what, we're just, we're going to do a Bible study method. Um, and so uh, if you didn't get a control note sheet on your way in, just go ahead and lift up your hand. The ushers will get that to you. It's just an opportunity for you to be able to take notes. Uh, the way I like to put it is if on your way in, okay, on your way in, if, if we handed you a $10,000 check on the way in, okay, and then at the end of service we prayed, we said, okay, you're dismissed. A hundred percent of you are going to make sure you walk out of this place with that check. You're going to make sure that you go straight to the ATM. You're going to make sure that you cash it as, as fast as possible so that that check uh, does, doesn't come back void, right? That that check doesn't bounce. You're going to make sure I go straight to the ATM and, and cash that check. Uh, but yet we give you a control note sheet every service. Sometimes you find those control note sheets on the floor. Sometimes you find them in the trash. Sometimes you take them with you, but then uh, it becomes your gum, your gum trash in your car. So why is it that sometimes we, we place greater value on money than we do on God's word? When God's word could do more for your life than a $10,000 check ever could. Oh, you don't believe me. Is there anybody in here that believes me that the, that the Word of God is what will sustain you, is what will feed you, is what will guide you? That it'll bring back a greater return than any $10,000 check ever can. So we have God's Word that we want to be able to put in your hands. Take notes tonight because the message is not meant to make you feel good about yourself tonight. Now we hope that it encourages you. We hope that it builds you up, but the reality is we come and we take notes so that we can go out and when we walk out of these doors, we can be better followers of Christ. That we can be those who let the word of God work through us, not just on a Wednesday night, but how about on a Thursday afternoon when you're at work? That on a Friday night when you're like, man, what, was, what did that preacher talk about? What was that scripture we went over? Well, you know, because you have the notes right there 
in front of you. So take notes tonight, not because my not because my words are good, but because the Holy Spirit is good and God's word never returns void. And so as long as you lean on that, you don't ever got to worry about it. But John chapter 21 is what we're going to be reading out of tonight. John chapter 21, <clears throat> we're going to start in verses 1 through 9, but to give a little bit of context of where we're at is John chapter 21 is after Jesus has already resurrected. So Jesus has resurrected, okay, and um, and he is now, we're now in the, in the period of, of 40 days where he spends time with his disciples. Um, and, and some of them get it and some of them, some of them don't get it. And that's where we pick it up here in John chapter 21, where, where they, they understand that he's, he's resurrected, but, but for some of them, they're still not quite sold on it yet. And it says, afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. They said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, have you, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. Verse six, he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, by the way, he's talking about himself in third person, said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. There with fish on it and some bread. I want to minister a message that I've entitled, Never the Same. Okay, never the same. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Father, for your scripture. We thank you, Lord, that your word never returns void. We thank you, Lord, that you've prepared a message to challenge us here this evening, Lord God. And I pray, Father, that it would equip us May it train us, may it lead us forward, Lord God. And may we see, may we see your kingdom be established here on earth in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody say amen, amen, and amen. Come on, turn to somebody next to you, say never the same, and you could go ahead and be seated here. And you know, there's, there's a lot of different uh, you know, perspectives that we could take from the scripture, but I wanna take the, the perspective here tonight of what's happened. You have the disciples who are together, namely Peter, who had been with Jesus three and a half years before his crucifixion. So three and a half years, they spent every day with Jesus. Three and a half years, they, they were taught, they, they, they were trained, they went out and, and they even did the work of the ministry and then they would come back and they would pray together, they would spend time together. But if there was anybody who knew Jesus, it would be the disciples. Because for three and a half years, they had the privilege, they had the privilege of being able to do everyday life with Jesus. Now Jesus is crucified and he's resurrected. And, and now they find themselves in a place that is unfamiliar. Okay, they find themselves in a place that is unfamiliar. And oftentimes, if we're not careful, we as humans, okay, we as humans, I don't know if you know this, but we are creatures of habit, okay? We do not like unfamiliarity. We do not like anything that makes us uncomfortable. Like, it can't even, it won't even be bad, but it's just like, I, just, I don't know, it just doesn't feel the same. But can I challenge you a little bit tonight and say that if you're ever going to grow the only way for you to grow is to not stay the same. That to stay the same would actually be the direct opposite of change. It'd be the direct opposite of growth because in order for growth to take place, change has to happen. 
Change has to happen. You cannot get to point B and remain in point A all at the same time. It is impossible. So we are creatures of, ha- of habit. We, we are creatures who we like familiarity. We like what's comfortable. We like what we've always known. But yet the disciples find themselves in an area and in a time and really what we would call it, they find themselves in a season that is unfamiliar. So what do they do? Well, for any of you that don't know who Peter is, Peter is one of the first disciples that was called by Jesus, and Peter was a fisherman, okay? He was actually, that when Jesus calls him into ministry, it is a very similar uh, uh, picture as to what we see here in John chapter 21, okay? When Jesus calls Peter into ministry, Peter is out on a boat, and he's having a hard day fishing. Jesus shows up, and he then has a good day fishing. John chapter 21, Peter's having a hard day fishing. Jesus shows up. Peter is now having a good day fishing. Now, do you think after three and a half years of spending every day with Jesus, that Jesus intended for Peter to go back to being a fisherman? It's not your question. I'll ask it again. Do you think that after three and a half years of doing everyday life with Jesus, that Jesus intended Peter to go back to being a fisherman. Ah, you guys catching on. No, Peter was never supposed to get back on a boat and go be a fisherman. Jesus actually told him when he calls him into ministry, he says, come and follow me and I am going to make you into a fisher of men. Nowhere in that dialogue did Jesus ever say, hey, make sure you save that boat because you're gonna go back to being a fisherman after the next three and a half years. No, never. He says, you are going to be a fisher of men, yet Peter finds himself back on a boat doing what is familiar. Doing what's familiar. And I don't know where you're at in your walk with Christ tonight, okay? Maybe you got saved this past weekend and you're like, man, I heard there was a midweek, so I'm here. Great, I'm glad that you're here. Maybe you've been coming, maybe you've been saved for a while, maybe you've been coming to Freedom House for a while, maybe, and you're like, yeah, we had another great Easter. It was awesome, cool. Easter was great. Over 250 salvations across all of our campuses, over eight services between Good Friday and Sunday Easter services, Fullerton, Irvine, okay, Espanol. It was an amazing four days. You wanna know what the enemy would love to do after an amazing weekend like that? You wanna know what he would love to do after you just had your friend come to church and your friend got saved and now your friend's like, man, when can we go, wait, how, how, how do we continue to grow this thing? You wanna know what the enemy would love for you to do? Would love for us to do? To go back to what's familiar to go back to what's familiar. Maybe this past weekend you just got saved. You just gave your life to the Lord. You just said, you know what, Jesus, I'm surrendering it all to you. And then Monday came. And then Tuesday came. And we just, maybe you just went back to what's familiar. If you just got saved, hey, no problem. That's why you're here on a Wednesday night. Because we know what the enemy's gonna try to do. We know the enemy's gonna try to get you back to what's familiar. Okay, those of you that have been around church for a while, you're like, oh yeah, we had a good weekend of service. We had a great weekend of services, cool. My challenge to you is, have you gone back to what's familiar? Have you just gone back to what's comfortable? To where, to where salvation no longer resonates in you? Maybe for some of you, you've already received the breakthrough you were looking for. Maybe, maybe God healed you from that addiction that, 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 that you had. Maybe, maybe God got you through that, that season of, of illness or disease or cancer. And now it's just like, ah, I'm just going to go back to what's familiar. And the scary part is, okay, the scary part is, is we'll sit in services just like this one. And we'll say, how could Peter go back to being a fisherman? but we go back to what's familiar each and every day. 
And sometimes, okay, sometimes it's going back to maybe a habit. Sometimes it's going back to, to an addiction. Maybe Sometimes it's going back to a bottle, to a pill. But sometimes it's just going back to a familiar thought. Familiar thought process. Familiar language. Well, it's just, you know, it's the guys, how we talk. It's familiar. Well, I'll never really do anything for God. You go back to a familiar thought. Well, I'm grateful that that's what God did for me, but ah, you know, it just seems like it's a little much. And so we go back to trains of thought that are familiar. And it's okay. It's okay if you've got on that train. It's okay if you've gone back to what's familiar. The challenge tonight is gonna be don't stay there. It would, it would be unfair for me to say, don't ever go back to what's familiar because Peter went back to what was familiar and he spent more days in person with Jesus than any of us ever have. Okay, in the flesh. And Peter went back to what's familiar. So odds are, odds are, if you're sitting here in this room tonight, if you're joining us online, you're listening to this afterwards, odds are you, there's been a moment or two or three or four or 20 or 25 where you've gone back to what was familiar just because it felt more comfortable. My challenge to you tonight is gonna to be let's not go back to what is familiar. Jesus did not die on the cross. He did not resurrect so that we can go back to what was familiar. Jesus died and rose again so that we can live the life we never had before, so that we can be the ones that are set apart, so that we can be the ones that are called out, so that we can be the ones that go out and cause active change and transformation and bring salvation to a people that are hurting, that are broken, and that are in need of a savior. But we'll never get there if we stay with what's familiar. We'll never get there if we stay with what's familiar. So how do we, how do we live a life that is never the same? Well, point number one is we have to stay away from familiar. We have to stay away from familiar. Galatians 5.1, Paul tells and urges the church. He says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Now, as I mentioned, sometimes, sometimes the enemy is going to come after you with the temptation uh, of an addiction or a habit. Okay, that, that used to entice you in the past. But other times he's gonna come, with, come to you and he's going to attack you in a way that just gets you to be stagnant. Okay, the Bible doesn't tell us in John 21 that Peter went back and Peter was sinning or that Peter had a foul mouth or that you know, he, he, he turned his back on Jesus again. The Bible just tells us he just went back to being a fisherman. He just went back to being stagnant. He went back to what was comfortable. He went back to what he felt was stable, stability. It's all I'm after, stability. What area of our lives have we been leaning more on familiarity than we have been the Holy Spirit? What area of our lives? Ask yourself that question. You don't got to answer it out loud, but ask yourself that question. What area have you been standing on what is familiar versus what is spirit-led? Because the reality is, is Jesus doesn't give us his Holy Spirit so that we can just go back to our normal way of life. Life as we know it. No, that's why Paul says, stand firm, therefore do not submit again back to a yoke of slavery. If Jesus has already broken that off of you, if Jesus has already led you out of that place, why would you go back? You already know it didn't bring you fulfillment. You already know that it didn't serve any purpose. You already know that it led you further away from feeling healed and fulfilled than anything else. Why would you go back? to what is familiar. So we have to stay away from what's familiar. Tell your neighbor, we're gonna stay away from what's familiar. 
Maybe it's a familiar relationship. Maybe it's a familiar grudge. Maybe it's a, f- a familiar grudge. The reality is there's some people in there tonight that you just, you don't know how to, how to maintain peace. You have moments of peace. You have moments of joy. But it's almost like something doesn't feel right if there's not something you're offended by. If there's not something you're holding on to. If there's not something to talk about at work or the next family gathering or it's like if there's not something for me to, to, to hold a grudge against, then something just isn't right. Can I come to tell you that Jesus wants you to live set free from all of that? He wants you to live set free from all of those thoughts, all of those toxic conversations that, that the grudge you're holding on to, it's not setting you free. It's actually holding you back to what's familiar, that if you would just let go of the grudge, you would have more peace. You would have more joy. You would be able to feel the fullness of the love of Christ, which is why he died on that cross was for you so that you wouldn't have to hold Hold on to it any longer. But the only way for us to fully let go of it is for us to step out and get away from what is familiar. You see, Jesus, Jesus told Peter, he said, Peter, I haven't called you to go back to what's familiar. I've actually called you to be set apart. Like, when did he say that? Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse 16. It says, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah. They have in dialogue. Many of this is known because Jesus ends up rebuking them, which, mind you, Peter, Peter's probably the most corrected disciple, okay? Bible college students will tell you that. Like, like, don't, get, like don't get me wrong. Like, Peter, Peter seems like, man, Peter walk on water. Peter, but Peter also had to get pulled back a whole lot. We have a saying around here, we'd rather pull you back than push you forward. Peter would fit in well here because we'd have to pull Peter back a lot. Like, Peter, hey, you got ahead of yourself, Peter. You answer that one a little bit too, hey, that's not exactly what we were talking about. And so he answers, says, you're the Messiah, you're the son of the living God. Verse 17, says, Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for this was not revealed to you by, my fle- by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. Verse 18, he says, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Haiti will not overcome it. That word church, I will build my church, that is ecclesia. The Greek translation of ecclesia into the English is those that are called out. The called out ones. So Peter knew in Matthew 16, Peter, I am calling you out from what is familiar. I am calling you out from a normal life. I am calling you out from just going back to what is normal and back to what is familiar because it is on you, it is on this court, it is on this faith, it is on this revelation that you have that I will build my church. So therefore, all of us who consider ourselves a part of the church of Jesus Christ, who, fo- who consider ourselves uh, those that follow Jesus, who call ourselves Christians, then guess what? This is the church that we're a part of. So us too are called out. And if we're called out, then we can't be called out while we still hang on to what's familiar. Because hanging on to what's familiar will keep us where we're at. And we can't be called out of... When my oldest son was, man, he must have been about two years old. Maybe he's one and a half. Went to a carnival. We got on. Uh, Merry-go-round, is that what they call it? No, I don't know. Carousel, there we go, see, got it, carousel. So on the carousel, okay, he had an amazing time on the carousel. Me, not so much, it was hot, it was the summer, sweating. All right, hey, carousel ride's over, let's get off the carousel. Go to pull him off the carousel, doesn't let go of the post, okay, like, I'm like, for, for being one and a half, okay, you're, you're a strong one and a half, you're like, he, I, we had to pry his hands off of, the pole that go, you know, goes through the horse to get him off of the carousel. I'm like, bro, there's other kids waiting to get on. We got to get out of this place. But some of us, that's how we hold on to what's familiar. 
And Jesus is saying, I got to get you to fulfill the purpose and the calling that I have for you. But if you keep holding on so tightly to what is familiar, I'll never get you to a place where you feel full peace, where you feel full joy, where you're able to walk in the purpose and the calling that I have called you out for. That I have called you out for. You know, Peter would eventually understand this. He would eventually get a revelation of this, and he shares it with us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Peter finally got it. And he says, church, it took me a while to get this revelation, but let me share it with you. You are a royal priesthood. You are a royal priesthood. Why? Because you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Okay, not because you went through Bible college, not because you went through a certain catechism, not because you were ordained. You are a royal priesthood because you say, Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. He has... He has anointed you, he has covered you, he has redeemed you, he has restored you. So therefore, you're a royal priesthood. Yes, even you who last week, you were at the club not living like a royal priesthood. Too soon? When you receive Jesus and the grace that comes only by faith, he says, I've now called you out. You are no longer the sins of your former self. You are no longer the addictions of your former self. You are no longer the name that you used to be called by, but you are now my royal priesthood who I have called out of the darkness to share my marvelous light. But you'll never step out of the darkness and into his marvelous light if you constantly hold on to what? used to be normal and what is familiar. So how do we, how do we grow comfortable stepping away from what's familiar? Point number two is you have to remain close. You have to remain close. Okay, for those of you that maybe you're You're newly what we would call saved. You've newly received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You're like, man, maybe you rededicated your life. You in your own strength and in your own understanding and your own wisdom. Okay, the Bible says that we are we are we are we are prone to wander. We are like sheep prone to wander. Okay, meaning that if we don't have a shepherd, we'll 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 wander all over the place. The reason why sheep need a shepherd is to keep them in line. The only way that we will stay in line knowing that we have a heart that is prone to wander is by remaining close. It's by remaining close. The Bible puts it this way in Psalm chapter one, verse one through three, they're gonna put it, it says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That the way that you remain close is by having a healthy diet of the word of God. When you have a healthy diet of the word of God, when, when, you're, when you're normal and your new familiar becomes opening up your Bible and reading it. When your new familiar and your new, your new normal becomes, I start my day with prayer. And I don't just start it and end it with prayer, but guess what? All throughout the day, when a whole bunch of other decisions are coming my way, guess what I'm constantly doing as Paul instructs us to do? And if I am constantly, I'm constantly in prayer. That prayer is not just a, 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 a morning, afternoon, evening discipline, but prayer is a lifestyle. It is, it is, it is a constant, it is Lord I don't want to make a decision or, or, or give a response if your spirit is not in it. And the only way for me to do that, Lord, is if I have a healthy prayer life. If my, if my, if my soul and my mind and my heart is planted in your word, 
That's where verse three says that person, okay, that person who meditates on his word day and night, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields fruit in its season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. That when you have a, a healthy discipline of, of staying close to God through his word, through prayer, that you're like a tree that is planted next to a river, planted next, ne next to a lake. You, you always have water. You always have the strength and the endurance to get through every season that you may have to go through. Now, you may not always have fruit, okay? I'm, we're we're going to keep it honest. Okay, we're, we're gonna keep it real. You may not always have fruit in those seasons, but guess what? Your leaf will not wither. Your leaf will not wither. Meaning you won't decay. You won't go backwards. And in the right season, you will bear fruit. But the one thing that remains constant is your strength and your endurance and your perseverance because that doesn't come from the fruit. That comes from the water that you're planted in. How else do we remain close? Okay, how else do we remain close? Acts chapter two, verse 42, it says, they devoted themselves. Okay, now these are the believers. Okay, these are the people that after... After the Holy Spirit comes, they begin to minister and the apostles and the disciples go and they begin to minister to people. It says they devoted themselves, okay, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. That the way the New Testament church got to the place where it's at now in 2024, the way that it's sustained, the way that the word has sustained is because this has been the constant, this has become the new familiar. This has become the new normal. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to fellowship, and to the prayers. That they said, Lord, not only are we going to remain close to your word and to prayer, but we're also going to form new friendships and new relationships that are gonna help us remain close when our heart is prone to wander, when we are going through a tough season. That's why we have connect groups, okay? I tell our Bible college, because during Bible college, we're going through New Testament letters, so we've been going through all Paul's letters and Peter's letters and the structure and the organization of the church, like why the church is the way that the church is. It's not just like, you know, not because we're super smart, but it's because we just apply what the Bible teaches us to do. So that's why we have connect groups. My wife and I, we're product of connect groups. Okay, we, I'm not just a pastor because I showed up one day and I said, hey, make me a pastor. Okay, cool, you're a pastor. like, no, like, we went through, it wasn't grow track back then. It was new life classes. We're dating ourselves, okay? New life classes, okay? We had, we had, we had Operation Life Change back in the day before we had Bible college. We had connect groups. And we said, Lord, we want to grow. And so we went through the same discipleship process we have that's available to each and every one of you. So guess, if it worked for me, guess what? It's going to work for you. If it worked for my family, guess what? It's going to work for your family. If it worked for my marriage, it's going to work for your marriage. And it's not because we're super smart people that came up with this innovative teaching. No, it's because we took Acts 2.42 and we said, what would that look like in Orange County? What would that look like in 2024? And this is what it would look like. But it's not just simply so that you can build new friendships. Now that's a part of what comes out of that, but it's to help you remain close to Jesus because when you remain close to Jesus, you get away from what's familiar. You get away from going back to what you thought was normal and you can live a life that is never the same. And you can live a life that is never the same. Now here's the danger if you don't stay planted, if you don't remain close to Jesus. First Peter 5, 8 says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil. Who's your adversary? Who's your adversary? 
Okay, so if there's anybody that's trying to come at you, who's coming at you? No, it's my coworker. It's my boss. It's, it's the devil. The enemy is after you because when you said, Jesus, I surrender my life to you, you put a big bullseye on your back. And now you came on. Now you came on the radar. Before you, there was no attention on you because you were just, you weren't a threat. Now you said, Jesus, you have, I'm surrendering my heart to you. Now there's the bullseye. Okay, and, and the enemy, he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now my wife will tell you I follow all these nature accounts and stuff on Instagram because I, I like wild animals and, you know, one of these days I'm going to get out to Africa and go on a safari and see these lions up close. Hopefully not too close, you know. But when lions hunt, okay, and lion, uh, a, a roaring lion is who Peter identifies the devil with here. When lions hunt, they don't ever hunt the pack. They don't ever hunt the pack. I shared this with our Bible college students last night. Because if a lion hunted the pack, it would get trampled. It would get trampled. Y'all seen Lion King? Anybody not seen Lion King? Okay, there was somebody in Bible college last night. I'm not gonna name names, Frank, but he hasn't seen Lion King. Frank's one of our support team members here at the church. And I'm like, man, you never seen Lion King? Homework, go watch Lion King, okay? But lions don't hunt the pack because when a lion hunts the pack, he makes himself vulnerable. Because a lion can defend himself against one or two, but a lion cannot defend himself against the pack. Why is it important to be a part of a group? Why is it important to remain close to fellow believers? Why is it important to be connected to the local church? Because when the enemy comes after you, he's gonna be coming after a pack, not just an individual. The lion comes for the one that's been disconnected from the pack. He fell behind, he was a little slow. He had a gimpy ankle. He hadn't been reading his word enough, hadn't been praying enough, so he sucked in a little bit, didn't have enough strength to keep up with everybody else. The one that is hanging around what's familiar. And the enemy comes after that one. And he identifies that one. And he goes after that one. So how do we get out of that? We remain close remain close to Jesus. We remain close to the church. We remain close to those who, who are going to be there to pray with us, to encourage us, to uplift us, to share the word with us. Not just share what their crazy uncle said one time, but share what God says because God's word never returns void. It is always constant. It is always life-giving. We have to remain close. And then last, how do we live a life that is never the same? We have to stir it up. We have to stir it up. As we continue reading on in John chapter 21, Jesus begins to have more dialogue with Peter. Peter's now come on shore. They shared a meal together. I told you it's biblical, okay? Shared a meal together. And Jesus begins to challenge Peter. It says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my lambs. It says again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Now a third time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt. It's like, Jesus, you know that I love you. But I don't know about you, but I, I sometimes I can have a sarcastic attitude. Sometimes people call it uh, condescending, you know. You ever got mad at somebody for being condescending? Guess what? Jesus is condescending right here. Because he asked him a third time. 
But I think if we read between the lines, Jesus is like, Peter, I'm asking you for a third time if you love me, because when I came looking for you, I found you back at what was familiar. I found you back on a fisherman's boat when you were not set apart and you were not called out to be a fisherman. How are you supposed to feed my sheep if you're out fishing? So he says, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He says, yes, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Stand to your feet with me here this evening. If we are going to live a life that is never the same, if we are going to live a life that is called out, that is set apart, that is on mission, that is on purpose, then we cannot go back to what's familiar. We cannot go back to what is comfortable. We have to be willing to fulfill the mission of Jesus when he says, go and feed my sheep. That if you really love me, that if your life is really surrendered to me, then go and fulfill the mission that I have set before you. Go and be the one to share how good Jesus is. Go to your schools, go to your community, go to your family. Tell them what Jesus has done in your life. Tell them that Jesus is Lord. Tell them that they have a hope, that they don't have to settle for what's familiar. They don't have to settle in the addiction. They don't gotta settle for divorce. They don't gotta settle for what's familiar, but they can find a new life and a new hope in Jesus. That's how we feed his sheep. Paul tells Timothy this. He says, for this reason, I remind you. Okay, so even Timothy had to be reminded. To fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Now we like to, we like to quote verse seven. God gives me a spirit of power, love and self-control or a sound mind. We love quoting that part of the scripture, but we never contextualize it with the first part that says fan into flame, the gift of God inside of you because sometimes when you fan into flame the gift of God inside of you it's going to cause you to take steps of faith that you've never taken before it's going to cause you to let go of what's familiar and sometimes that can be scary but he says don't worry as long as you keep fanning into flame that gift of God that is inside of you you don't got to be afraid of letting go of what's familiar you don't got to be afraid of letting go of of, of what was normal you don't got to be afraid of letting go of that relationship you don't got to be afraid of letting go those toxic friendships because I will be with you you just have to continue to stir it up you got to continue to fan it into flame you got to continue to remain close you got to continue to keep your eyes on me keep your eyes set forward keep your eyes on the calling and on the purpose that I have for your life and when you do that you will live a life that is never the same. When you do that, you'll make Easter not just a weekend, but you'll make Easter and the resurrection a way of life for you and for your marriage and for your family and for everyone that you are connected to. Come on, give Jesus a shout of praise tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Jesus, I thank you right now, Lord. I thank you right now, God, that you're You're fanning into flame the gift of God inside of us. Lord, that tonight we make a declaration to you that we refuse to go back to what's familiar. That familiar relationship, that familiar way of thinking, that familiar familiar talk. But Lord, we will put our trust in you put our faith in you that we know as long as you are with us Lord God that there is nothing that can come against us that there is nothing that can stop us that the faith we have in you is greater than any fear that can keep us connected to familiarity 
So tonight, we make a faith decision to stay close to you. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's sing this song out.